So thank you. We're going to talk a little bit today about some primary heating and cooling plants, central plants, and how to optimize them for energy efficiency. So we're going to dive in, and one of the things we're going to talk about is you know, a little bit on why central plants. What are we looking for? Some of the strategies. Talk about that little thing. Everyone focuses on the central plant, the chillers or boilers, but also talk a little bit about the distribution systems. Then dive into the existing building commissioning. Because we design a system, but we need to make sure it operates. You know, if we design it and it works great on paper, it doesn't help us with our energy. So I talk about the existing building, and then I've got a case study at the end for a, a kind of a unique facility. So I had this graphic here, and it kind of talks about what are the rationale for having a central plant. And it's kind of a hectic slide, it's a little busy, it's got a lot of things, and it's kind of made it to be that way. There's a lot of things that push you to want to have a central plant. You're trying to reduce noise, centralize, always save money. One of all the ways to save money is also to save energy. Also to improve flexibility and make it safer. So the same rationale, when you take a look at the sheet, you can say, well, maybe that's the rationale for any engineering decision. And what you're going to realize is a lot of the principles that we learn in engineering and consultancy are applied, but there are just some unique little twists when you look at for a central plant or when you look at when you're applying a natural ventilation solution. But we have some of these same goals we're trying to achieve. You just have to find the right solution for your problem. So we'd say, why do we look at a centralized plant? I have some examples here of why. It's to save money, resources, energy. And when you take a look at some of these examples, a healthcare campus, you move to a central plant, you can save 30% typically. <coughs> I love the convention and hospitality. Facilities that are you know, used infrequently or maybe not 100% at the same time, you can get up to a 50% savings of some of those facilities by putting in a central plant that can serve multiple locations within that campus. So this is what we're looking at doing, is we're really trying to capitalize on our engineering ability to supply multiple things with one source. I want to just remind everybody, there is no one answer. Recently I was speaking in India, a student chapter, and I said, well, what is the system we should use? And I said, all of them. It's different for every application. Is it a hotel? Is it occupied? What type of operation staff does the facility have? Does it need to be a marquee facility? Is it made to make a statement? So you have to go through and analyze it, and there is no single solution. And this for the consulting engineers, I know we've all done it and we kind of get that, oh my gosh, we have a deadline, avoid the copy and paste design. Have some fun. Go to the knowledge libraries that ASHRAE has created, get articles, white papers on current technologies, and have some fun. Move, do something different. Step out of your comfort zone and design something new and creative. But remember, there is no single solution. You know, students are always looking for that right answer. But really what you need to do is you need to find the right answer for that right event. So we're going to just talk a little bit about, and I'm going to walk through a, a scenario where we select a central chilled water plant scheme. So I'm going to lay kind of the framework, and this is for like a large campus or a health hospital. And hospitals are always unique because one of the things they seem to do is they seem to have about five or six different generations of the building, which always adds some different challenges to them. But we're going to go through and it basically is their basic building. We'll have a heat rejection section for cooling towers, have a chiller room, boiler room, and then also the electrical room. One of the big things you also have to realize is what are your limitations? In certain parts of the world, there are projects where maybe you don't have the electrical power, so you need to go with a mixed fuel source. And I'm working on one project where the utility grid is getting a little stressed. So they're putting in engines that generate power using the heat to power natural gas absorbers and electrical chillers because there isn't enough of the utility power. So we're going to go through and look at kind of just your standard chillers and towers. Then we'll move to maybe one with low temperature, heat recovery, and then one that uses ice. Now I did have the honor of uh, going to see a lab where there was a research on some absorption chillers. And I mentioned, you know, it's always easy to think of ice as a cooling, but we, we also have absorption. And I mentioned, you know, there was a training course I used to do on how apples fall up or how gas cools. So remember, there's a different solution for every need. So keep your eyes and ears open. So we look at our base scheme, 
And this is nothing fancy. This is where you start. You start with your base ideas when you're looking at optimizing a chiller plant. You get creative after you pick your scheme and you dive into what control strategies you use, what enhancements you use, how you can tweak and get some energy efficiency. But first you start with your basic unit. Don't get too far ahead of yourself. Figure out what path you're going to be on before you try to tweak it. And it's just your basic system of towers, primary and secondary pumping, and chillers. Now when we look at this, it has your pretty common pros. It's very simple. Everyone's familiar with that configuration. It's reliable, has a long life expectancy. It does have some you know, piping costs and high pumping energy that you do pay a penalty for. But you need to evaluate the pros and cons. As I was growing up, I always was told when you make a decision, you know, draw a line on a piece of paper, put a plus on this side and a minus, and try to fill up each side. And that will help you choose between the goes. So we also want to make sure you look at what are the cons, not just the pros. We can start to take a look, and when we say we want to go to low temperature, we keep the exact same configuration. We just switch out components. Again, as engineers, we want to try and keep it simple and get creative after we choose our path. That's one of the key things we work with our young engineers at our consulting firm, is make sure you get your basics before you start getting advanced. If you start to do advanced things first, it typically falls down. So we have some of the interesting pros and cons that change here. It has a lower system cost. Better dehumidification. Now in certain parts of the world, like here, maybe you need some better dehumidification. Because with that lower temperature, you can really bring moisture out. One of the biggest cons I'd like to put down here is it's more complex. It's different. And as Tim mentioned, we need to step out of our comfort zone, but the challenge is we can choose to do so. But as designers, we hand our building over to an operating staff. They maybe didn't choose to step out of their comfort zone. So if you give them a system that's different or more complex, you need to make sure they understand it and optimize it and run it as intended. If not, we end up creating this beautiful system and they run it just like their last system they operated. So those are one of the challenges we always have to deal with when we get to something that's a little bit more complex. We dive in and we add another little layer of complexity here, but it really helps drive some of the flexibility for a central plant system. In this case, we've added some thermal storage. It can be ice, it can be low temperature water where it uses stratification. But it's just a means to basically take and store your energy so that it can handle surges, take advantage of utility rates, part load efficiencies, things of that nature. So one of the things that this does is that it kind of helps with maintaining the maintenance footprint. Even better deunification has a great things for part load. But what I also like is reliability. There's some interesting things you can do with this. We've designed some data centers where we use the thermal storage as backup cooling. And one of the things I know, if you put a water tank above your water source, it falls down. Imagine that, you now have free pumping for your emergency <coughs> chiller source. So we've designed systems where we can take and use that thermal energy storage to save energy, but also provide a backup source for cooling in the event of power loss that has its own pumping system that flows the water through. Challenge is again, it's a little complex. Some of these systems are also based on utility structures. One of the things we know is a change. So if you design a system based on a certain utility structure, that utility structure may change. So your system needs to be flexible, and that's where once you pick a system, you need to make sure you add those elements down the road. So we've laid out our systems, and we won't actually dive too deep, but I want to just talk about this concept of how do you pick? As engineers, we're dying to get in there and put our details into our design. We're itching to kind of throw out there what are our control strategies. But we need to pick a path and a way to go. So one of the things is we've developed kind of this sheet, and it's basic. We take a look and say, what is our cost? First cost, then energy. And we also have a life cycle and maintenance. One of the things we try to do with this sheet is we try to de-emphasize the first cost to make sure we're making an intelligent decision based on the big picture. We 
take a look at operational issues. Does it need special training? And if you take a look, the operational issues have the same weight factor as cost. Then we even bring in maintenance issues, environmental. Now, how many uh, architects are in the room? Oh, good. We only give them 10 points, so. Um, <laughs> central trailer plants, they're beautiful for us. I love when I go to a hotel and I look at them like, oh, look, there's cooling towers, and air handlers. That's the view I want to see from a hotel. You know, other people, the architects are probably like, can we hide it, put screens around it, and block its airflow so it doesn't really reject heat well. No, so we don't really give the architects too much of a swing at the central plants because this is really a source for one purpose, and it's not to be beautiful, it's to really produce chill water and heating. But we look at the environmental effects, and we take a look and we compare all these elements. So a lot of this has to deal with after your design. And that's an important factor to wrap your head around is you're designing not for just a piece of paper, you're designing it to last. These are 30, 40 years before you have to do major maintenance. They can last hundreds of years by just you know, doing maintenance on and on. So we put you know, a two to one ratio from cost, we put operational and maintenance. So make sure you take a look at that. And then you can kind of pull through and see, it kind of shakes out what you want to choose. So in this case, we went through and we, we, we pulled them all together. And for this scenario, it was the ice system. The facility already had some ice storage on there, so the operation staff understood it. So there wasn't that much of an issue with training, but the energy was great. So once you take your path and you choose your main option, now you go that direction. And then you optimize, and you enhance, and you get creative. But you need to first kind of break your path down. Otherwise, one of the key things that we talk about in project management for the engineering consultancy is you need to be efficient. That means you can't design five buildings to 80%. You need to kind of make your decision quicker so that you can put that detail and creativity and get the value to the owner. So now we kind of pull up, and one of the things that I love this graphic is when you take a look at it, you've got your row of towers, a lot of pumps. You've got your row of chillers, a lot of pumps. And then a lot of pumps on the secondary side. You gotta get a theme here, there's a lot of pumps. You need to move all this, especially if you're doing a central plant, where often you put the plant here, and it has loads scattered about around it sometimes. So your pumping energy can become significant. So we also want to focus on that pumping energy. And one of the things we always try to do is we, we kind of draw on this as a, a basic curve that shows your flow rate and your load. And our yellow line is that lovely heating system. It's always efficient. As you drop your flow rate, your load follows as well. What we try to avoid is if we have and we have this thing called DT syndrome, delta T syndrome. Everybody familiar with that kind of the, the sickness we call it for a building. When you have a poor delta T, you end up with scenarios. Let's see if we have a point. Where here we are at 90% of flow, and we're you know 60% of load. We're really not being able to take advantage of that efficiency when our load drops. How often does your building hang out at 100%? Not that often. So you need to design your system where it's going to run. So you need to make sure you can minimize this gap. Uh -huh. And we do that by making sure we maintain our delta T. So when we look at our central plants, one of the key things we need to take a look at is how are our chillers tied into our plants, and then also how are our buildings and our loads tied into our distribution. Quite often you get called to a facility and they say, we need you to optimize my central plant. And I go, okay, great, I want to go take a look at your buildings and see you know, how you're tapping, what your flow rates are, what your delta T's are at each building. And they go, but no, my problem's at the central plant. Yep. That's just the source. We need to find the things that impact it. So we need to help make sure we can minimize that. And often we find that by finding areas where maybe we're tapping in and we're maybe not helping our building have a good delta T. Because on paper, we design our system always with this nice magenta line but we often find our buildings running here. So we've kind of done society an injustice by designing a system but letting it operate at an efficiency that's nowhere near what it's capable of. So we take a look at this, and one of the key things we're finding is sometimes it's much more efficient when you take central plants, and if you're doing that, add a second central plant. Maybe distribute it throughout the location. So you don't have as much of a pumping penalty. 
The other thing is if your central plant is for a campus and it's expanding, you've already installed your distribution piping for that initial campus and the initial loads. If you add more buildings and loads, your piping may not be large enough, and nothing is more disruptive to a space than to rip up all the ground and lay new piping. So adding your distribution plant scattered about, you can keep your core piping size the same at the local elements of the system, but increase the capacity. And this is an example, and I, I use this one because it's great, because I look outside my window of my office, and I look down at this, and talk about a good view. You know, seeing Chicago, you can see cooling towers everywhere, it's great. And there oh, happens to be the you know, Chicago River right there too. But I, I think as an engineer, we look at the, the cooling towers and see the, the beauty of this plant that saves so much energy by centralizing its use, capitalizing on this as an ice plant that makes most of its chilled water at night when the loads are lowest, so reducing the grid of the stress. But as the system expanded, you know, we moved and put locations at different parts of the city so we could keep our utility piping the same size very hard to find locations for 30 and 36 inch piping running through the middle of the streets. Or one meter. So one of the key things, I mean, we take a look and we also have to make sure we find that distribution and that's our biggest area. So I want to take a look in a little bit and I know a lot of people that have consulting firms, I know a, a common trend in the US is we have what's called a lunching learn. And a specific vendor will come in and they'll talk to you about how their product is best and they'll optimize that product. Be very careful. You need to optimize the system. So your job is to take that information received from each manufacturer and find a way to improve the entire system. So we take a look, and in this scenario, we can take a look and say, okay, we're just gonna drop our temperatures a little bit. You know, increase some of our delta Ts. And we can say, well, this costs us energy. Why would we ever do that? Because it might cost us chiller energy, but we save it in our pumping. And we stack all the savings together, and we actually produce the savings by wasting energy. And this is an interesting thing. We always struggle when we talk to our young engineers, we say, don't pick the most efficient chiller, pick the most efficient system. And that's where you really need to kind of break out of your shell and take a look at the whole picture. There's some great modeling tools that can help you run these simulations. And also when you're working with your manufacturers, explain to them what are your pros and cons, what am I trying to do? Do you have a high pumping load? Are you pumping chilled water along great distances? If so, you might look at a different system. If you're all centralized in one location with minimal pumping loads, you might go to a different system. Again, not the same answer for each building. But this is a, a very powerful slide that tells you engineering, even though it might be basic, can get rather complex because you're going to have things where you say this is a loser, this is a winner, I need to add them all and see what is my choice. So when we take a look and we analyzed, and you know, one of the things we took a look at is you know, where is the sweet spot? I apologize, this one is in Fahrenheit, it's around a 20 degree Fahrenheit delta T seems to be what we found to be the sweet spot if you have a large pumping component to your facility. So one of the things what we look at doing is we we like to drop that temperature. I know in parts of the U.S. it's humid as it is here. We need to bring that moisture out. Because one of the things we like to do is, you know, we maybe pay a little more for our chiller, but we can reduce air handlers. We can reduce duct work. But one of the other things we can do is we can capitalize on that comfort feeling. You know, if you have air that is drier, it can be warmer and you still feel comfortable. You know, I always think of, you know, a good example is when you walk down the freezer section in like a grocery store and it feels so cold. Well, that's because they're struggling with their balance on their temperature and humidity. But if you can take and wring out that moisture and make it be a little drier, you can push that temperature and you still stay within the ASHRAE comfort range. So if you haven't worked with it, you know, I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at Standard 55 from ASHRAE and really understand how you can change your energy consumption by changing and floating around that box that is considered the comfortable zone. You can jump multiple degrees and still remain comfortable by changing what the relative humidity is. So now we're going to talk, we've talked a little bit about what the plant is. And I'm a little over my time, but I'll try to go as quickly as possible. Um, we're going to talk about how we maintain that. 
and how we make sure we can get that savings. Now, how many people have been involved in uh, commissioning projects here? It's a, kind of a newer trend outside of the U.S., but what's really interesting is, and I too, like Tim, grew up where I, I had a father who was an engineer, and when I told him I was going to start doing some commissioning, he said, that's what the engineer does. So I took a look at the scope of work, and he pulled out something that was typed on a typewriter, which some people might still know what it is. And we looked at the scope, and it was the exact same elements that a commissioning scope is. So again, I'll, I'll blame the architect who probably beat out the engineer's scope of services, and this new person came up with this great idea called commissioning. But what you really need to do is you need to validate the installation and operation. And when you do that commissioning, you do it by number of points. You don't just do it by cost. And your central chiller plant, remember, is a very basic picture. It had, what, 20 pieces of equipment. So there's very few points, so it's very easy to commission. But it's often overlooked. It's kind of like the elephant in the room, they always say, because you don't see it. Now, I will give architects credit here. They hide our stuff inside of the built environment very well. You don't really realize there's a plant producing cold air. Prior to that, there's a plant producing chilled water that's rejecting heat to the outside. But in this room, we barely hear a low rumble, so it's perfect. So people don't complain about the central plant. They complain about the room. Because what's the number one source of tuning your system? Occupants. They always will complain and say, it's too hot, it's too cold, it's too noisy, it's too loud. No one will ever say, you know, I think you're running your chill water a little too warm. Maybe you should lower that. Unless you have an engineer in there who says, okay, maybe we're not getting a suppression. But they won't help you tune your chill water plant, so it's often forgotten. So we need to remember, that's the core of your building. It's kind of the heart. And it's got very few pieces, so it's very easy to test. But sometimes it's not that easy, because as you build a building, you put this heart in, but it maybe doesn't have the arms and legs and things. You can't just put it on a treadmill and test your chill water plant. So one of the things you need to figure out, and this is where you need to get creative with your chill water plant, because it's often built for the future, so it maybe has capacity that's much greater than what it actually has loads attached to it, is how do you test it? How do you make sure it works? You kind of have to put like a fake body, a fake treadmill. And also write down on how the operator can make sure it's working good in the future. The next thing that I love my little yin yang for the central plant and the pumping, not one is larger than the other. Not one comes first and the other comes second. You need to take a look at both of these at the same time and find what's best. But if you're looking to save energy, typically you can find it by saving on the pumping energy. You have more creativity, more options there than within the chillers and boilers. So you have more fun things you could try to do on a pumping to save that energy. So look into those areas. Make sure you're keeping your delta T efficient. One of the things you can also find and say is, is there a single source that maybe needs a suppressed colder water? If you put a singular little chiller for that location, and you can change the whole rest of your campus. You know, don't pay a penalty for one little spot. We find that often in buildings that have a mixture of uh, you know, process, office, lab, things of that nature. But when we get into this, and this is one of the things I want to talk about, it, what are the roles of people when we do commissioning? You know, the owner hires people to help it succeed. The <laughs> operations staff, they're your most valuable person. They will tell you all the skeletons that are in the closet. They might not know why, but what's often they'll, they'll ask them, well, what can we do differently? They'll say, I've got a problem over here. We should change this. Listen to what the problem is. You might have a different solution because maybe it's one or two layers deep in the onion. But as a person, as an engineer who's helping them do the commissioning, be patient. Listen, listen, listen. Don't just jump to the first conclusion. Because many of these issues, when you take a look and say, my chiller is inefficient, it might be due to a pumping system in one of the buildings, not the chiller itself. So now I'm going to spend a few minutes on a, a case study. And for those that have been to the ASHRAE show in Chicago, you've seen the McCormick Place. It's one of the largest exposition facilities in the, in the world. I'll be in three. So a quick overview. Here's the facility, and it, it, it's kind of interesting, and I know to walk across it from 
here to here. It takes around 15 or so minutes because I tailgate down here and then go watch those bears try to play football uh, every weekend in the winter. So I'm going to talk about this plant. What's interesting is it does have three chilled water plants in it. And they're scattered about mainly to reduce the pumping energy, but also because this facility keeps growing. Every couple of years they add more square footage. So we have you know, 10,000 tons in the oldest plant, which actually uses river water and lake water for cooling. So it's kind of grandfathered in, which isn't the most efficient. But the next plant uses around 8,000 tons and produces chill water at around negative 2.7 C. And then the newest part uses ammonia screw compressors, which we like for their uh, friendliness to the environment. And they're also very good at making nice cold water, again, around that minus 2.7 C. With 8.5 million gallons of thermal energy storage. So you say, why do you do this? So this is an interesting chart. We look and we say we design our building for the peak. But this plot is for the year, and it shows where the building actually operates and where its peak is. So we talk about convention centers are great facilities because very rarely is the entire facility used. And you can see here, this each one of these little spikes is a day. And you can see it spikes up when there's a show in town, and then it goes, and they're setting up, and then there was a daily show there. So you're trying to make sure you can handle whatever the building throws at you without having to install this massive amount of equipment. How can you get by with just this? So you do that with thermal storage so that you can absorb those peaks by grabbing that energy that you store in the tanks and use it to cover the loads. You know, some of the things that this saved, you know, we produced, you know, around a 27 degree water, we used ethylene glycol. It had 100 miles of hydronic piping. So when we talk about Lowering that temperature and saving a little bit on your pipe size, you multiply that fraction of a size smaller by 100 miles, it really adds up. 50 miles of duct work. So there's some great savings you can realize there. 1 million CFM reduced. $3 million in equipment saving. It actually was cheaper because the lower cost in duct work and piping offset the higher cost of the thermal energy storage. So again, looking at the whole picture, not just maybe your chillers, which is always kind of the first thing you look at. With that, I think my time. Perfect. Thank you. Are there any questions?